So I wanna tell you a story to get started. And it's one of my it moments. It's a silly, small moment, but it actually taught me a huge lesson that sets up where we're going today. See, years ago, I was driving a trailer to one of our student men retreats. And, and if you've been at our Why Missing Willow Street or our soon to be West York campus, you will see one of these giant white trailers that we use as a part of our setup and takedown locations. And those three locations are just awesome. And I'm loving what happening, what's happening right there, right now with them. But here's what you gotta know. I grew up pulling a ton of trailers. I moved trailers all over the place. I've hooked up a million trailers, but because I learned how to hook up a trailer before cars had backup cameras, which that sentence will make you feel very, very unnecessarily old, uh, I didn't exactly know how to hook up a truck and trailer. And so I've developed this horrible habit that is with me to this day. See, whenever I got to back up a, a truck and trailer, I get to where I need to go and I back up using my best guess, hoping that in my best effort, the ball of the truck is close to the trailer hitch. And then I go back and if it's not close enough, I just kind of like nudge the trailer over. You know what I mean? Anybody else hook up a trailer like that? You just nudge it. Or if it's light enough, you just pick up the trailer and set it directly on the ball. And you're like, I'm incredible, I did it, you know? And, and that's kind of the skill that I developed when I'm 17 and I had more muscles than skills. Like it was easier to move the trailer than to learn how to actually back up the truck. So it's, it's a terrible habit I have. Well, years ago, we had taken one of those massive trailers to the student men event, and it was time to re-hook it up. So I did what I always did. I get in the truck and I back it up using my best guess, getting as close as I could, hoping it was close. And I get out and I realize I'm like two inches off. So this time I go back and I just realize, I, I'm just like, I'm just gonna nudge it over, but I realize something really, really quick. There is no way on God's green earth I was gonna move this trailer. Like I tried pushing it, I tried pulling it, I tried kicking it, I was crying over it, I tried lifting it. It, for whatever reason, weighed a ton and I could not budge this thing. Well, now, because I can't move the trailer, I'm left playing this awful game. The game is called, Can You Find the Hitch? So I get in the truck, I pull it forward, I scoot it over, I back it up, I run back, I realize I've moved the trailer, the hitch on, too far over this way, I get back in, I move over, I, scoot, I realize I put the ball on this side of the hitch. So literally I'm just playing whack-a-mole with an F-350 trying to find the hitch of the trailer and the ball of the truck. And I cannot get the thing to line up. And while I'm doing this horrible charades, I'm thoroughly cashing in my man card, proving I do not know how to hook up a truck and uh, trailer, Jordan Buckwater, who's our effort uh, worship leader, he's inside, watching my colossal train wreck happen. Well, finally, in disgust and pity, he walks out, looks at me with one hand in his pocket, reaches down with his other hand, picks up the trailer like it's a gallon of milk, sets it on the ball, shrugs his shoulders and walks in. Problem solved. Guys, my jaw is dropped. Like how in the world did he do that? Like I'm waiting, I've tried moving it, I've tried nudging it, I've tried pushing it. There is no way a mere human should be able to do that. And I'm just waiting for Jordan to like rip open his shirt and be like, I got an S on my chest, you know? Like, I'm like, how did you do that? For me, this moment, this circumstance was quickly becoming in some ways a it moment for me. It was a circumstance in a moment that I didn't ask for. I didn't ask to have the trailer glued to the earth and I wasn't prepared to hook it up. I didn't feel prepared, I didn't ask for it. But for Jordan, it wasn't an it moment. It wasn't even really a moment. And when I asked him the other day if I could share this story, he didn't even remember the moment happening. <laughs> He's like, I don't remember that at all. It was like such a passing non moment for him. My it, my I didn't feel prepared for this moment, didn't ask for this moment, as silly as this moment was, was nothing to him. But it's one thing to talk about trailers and hitches and feats of unnatural strength. But, but have you ever seen someone, have you ever seen someone get news that would crush you? overwhelm you, blow you away, rock your world, and they didn't miss a beat? Have you ever seen someone in a circumstance that would have you raging, blowing your top, letting the words fly, and they somehow or another just take it in stride? Like it's no big deal? Now, I'm not talking about people who live in denial, God bless them, but, but do you know those people who just seem to be built different? Just like they're stronger than the rest of us, more resilient than the rest of us. 
Which leads me to what I want us to talk about today. How do we build resilience to face what's coming? How do we build resilience to face what's coming? See, uh, what I wanted to believe about Jordan in that moment was that he was some freak of nature, a superhero with powers that no mere mortal could ever dream of having. I wanted to declare that he was simply something I could never be. When in reality, he was not a superhero, but at the time he was a mason and he spent hours a day picking up and putting down really, really heavy things. And he had prepared in a way that I hadn't. He had laid a foundation personally that I did not have, that made him more resilient to the circumstances that were overwhelming me that wasn't anything to him. He had a bigger foundation than me so he could handle bigger moments than me. So let me say that again, because it's really important for where we're going today. Another way of saying all of this is, the better the foundation we have, the better we can handle it. The better the foundation we have, the better we can handle it. Jordan is literally twice as strong as I am, so he can literally lift twice as much as me. So what would overwhelm me didn't him. And this is true not only for our muscles, our physical strength, which is kind of easy to understand, but what Jordan modeled for me that day is what Jesus had spoken about years earlier, that this, this is also true, it's true for our faith, our relationships, our emotions, our finances. It's true that the better the foundation we have, the better we can handle it. The better the foundation we have, the better we can handle it. Uh, Jesus illustrated and talked about this in Matthew chapter seven, verse 24 through 27. So here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, anyone who listens, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes and the torrents and the flood waters, waters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Basically what Jesus is saying is what Jordan modeled and it's the truth that we're talking about today, the better the foundation we have, the better we can handle it. The better the foundation we have, the better we can handle it. The better our foundation, the better our resilience is to handle bigger circumstances and moments, circumstances and moments that we don't ask for, that we don't feel prepared for. When we build on solid rock, on bedrock, when we get a foundation that weathers the storms, we can survive. But if we don't build on bedrock, we won't be able to handle the storms. Guys, because this matters so much, because I want you and I want me to be able to handle all the it that will come our way, I want us to unpack what Jesus is saying here for a moment. First, I want us to break some urban legends, some lies, and I want us to catch a detail that Jesus is saying here. Catch this, Jesus said, though the rain comes, and he said, when the rains and floods come and the winds beat, though and when, he's not saying if or maybe or possibly, he's saying when it comes, when it hits the fan, when it feels like the world around us is going crazy. It is not if, it is when. It is not if it will hit the fan, but when it hits the fan. And so guys, with as much love and grace as I can, I just wanna give you a heads up. Some stuff's gonna happen to you. Some stuff's gonna happen in your life. There will come a day that parents die, that your kids, as much as you try to protect them, will get hurt. Big bills that you were not prepared for will surprise you. Jobs will be lost. Diagnoses will come. There's a lie out there that Christianity it's about getting you out of pain or avoiding problems. And guys, following Jesus is not some magic wand. We get to wave over our life and our family and our finances to be blessed beyond measure for all of our days. If you're coming to church to get out of pain, to make the trouble stop, and I just gotta let you know, you're going to be very, very, very disappointed because Jesus was very, very, very clear. It's not if the storms come but when they come. 
Jesus said it again, even more clearly in the book of John. He says, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will, not maybe, not possibly, you will have many trials. It will hit the fan. You will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Guys, trouble is coming. It will hit the fan. But Jesus knew, and he wants us to know, the better the foundation we have, the better we can handle it. The better the foundation we have, the better we can handle it. But, but how? How do we lay a better foundation? How do we find bedrock? How do we find something solid to build our lives alone? How I want to weather all the storms, and I know you want to weather all the storms, but, but how? How do we do this? And thankfully, Jesus tells us, like he tells us how. He says, listens to my teaching and follows it. Listens to my teaching and follows it. Putting it a little bit more clear, he said, listen and follow. Listen and follow Jesus. Listen and follow Jesus. Listen to his teaching. Guys, something happens when we just keep listening to what Jesus said, when we just keep putting his words in our heart, just putting them deep inside of us. I love how the Psalms speak about this. The Psalm says, I have hidden, I have put, I have embedded, I have listened and your words are in my heart that I might not sin, I might not mess this thing up against you. Your word is a lamp into my, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. And something happens. Something happens when we keep putting Jesus's teaching in us. It grows in us. It takes root in us. It becomes something in us. It's like a song that just gets stuck in your head and you find yourself singing it without even knowing it. Guys, the more that I listen to God through being at church, through messages, through, through worship songs, through Bible reading, through Bible reading plans, through small groups, through books that I pick up, the more that all that goes in, the more that I just have sitting there just waiting, waiting to be put to use, which then leads to the second part. I mean, it's one thing to listen, but listening only goes so far. I know this might come as a surprise to you guys, but I'm not a Navy SEAL. I, I swim like a rock, but I listen to a lot of Navy SEALs books. Like I listen to a ton of them, but I don't follow them. I listen, but I don't follow and Jesus was really clear. He said, listen and then follow. Listen and then take a step. Listen and then trust what he said enough to do it. Listen and follow. And some of us need help doing this. And I get that. So that's why we, we talk so much about small groups around here. I mean, groups are just launching around our campuses and it's not too late to jump in. So get into one and just say, hey, can we listen and follow together? Listen and follow together. Can you get a part of a group that helps you move forward together? Uh, we talk a lot about being on serve teams around here. And it's real easy to think that a serve team is about you giving something when personally, I think serving is way more about what I get. And I just wanna let you guys in on a really odd church hack. So if you wanna hack church, this is what you need to know. Um, something special happens when you gather at church. Like something special happens when you're here. Like you're putting in, you're getting encouraged. Like something happens when you're here. But if getting to church consistently is hard, which I totally understand because life is hard and confusing some days, um, one of the best ways to, to make, have a hack to get here is to join a serve team. Because it's harder to skip, it's harder to miss when you know you have a team waiting on you. And what I love is your serve team really becomes your growth team. Your serve team becomes your growth team to help you keep moving, to not just listen, but to follow. Guys, I choose to never exercise alone because if I gotta show up by myself, it's way too easy to skip. But if I know if I got someone waiting for me, I show up. So, so how do we lay a better foundation? How do we lay a foundation that can weather the storms? Jesus was clear. He said, we, we listen and then we follow. We, we listen and then we follow. And, and step after step, baby step after baby step, you become stronger. You become different. Jordan that day lifted the trailer, not because he did one workout, but because he lifted one brick after another brick, after another brick, after another brick, day after day after day after day, and who knows what is coming, what it will hit your fan, 
But Jesus promised that if we will spend our life listening and following, listening and following, a foundation will be laid that can withstand the storms. And, and if I was you, I, I would be sitting there being very skeptical. I mean, all of this just sounds too easy. It's too bubblegum theology. Like, listen, obey, and everything will be okay. Like, I get that that's like easy to dismiss and discredit. And it's, it's the belief that just listening and obeying daily small steps, that that's actually enough. That, it, that It's easy to believe that it won't prepare you, that one brick at a time isn't enough to make you strong enough. But guys, I gotta let you know. I've been... I've been pastoring for about 18 years now and I've seen it over and over and over and over again. Normal people, people like you and me, who simply spend every day listening and following, listening and following, listening and following, somehow surviving unbelievable moments, moments that would blow some of us away because they had laid a foundation that was ready for the storm. I recently, I, um, recently I reached out to a, a hero of mine and I, uh, I got permission to come to his house and to record him and his wife telling me their story. And, and uh, I wanted to, to record their story and, and talk to him because when it comes to people who have faced it, I don't know anyone who's faced more it in their life. I mean, these two have, they have faced more in their life together than anyone else I know. And somehow or another, after all of that, they're still standing. Um, so I wanna introduce you to one of my heroes. And if you've been around LCBC for a while, you might know this guy. I wanna introduce you to Keith Walker. Uh, Keith is just, oh man, I love this guy. And if you don't know him, you need to know this about him. His fingerprints are literally all over our church. I mean, we have staff, we have elders, we have hundreds if not thousands of volunteers who are leading in huge ways simply because of his teaching and influence over the years. <clears throat> A ton of our pastors have learned how to actually pastor because of this guy. Uh, and Keith and Lynn, they started attending LCBC in uh, 2021 and um, that's wrong. Now that it's 2020, I cannot say 2000 anymore. In 2001. And so they started attending in 2001. And shortly after that, he got invited into the teaching teams for the weekends. And then he started leading our high schoolers. And, and I actually had the privilege of interviewing with him when he was the interim high school pastor. And he has just got his fingerprints everywhere. He went on to lead our singles ministry for a long time. He even led at our Waynesboro campus as an interim campus pastor there for a bit. Uh, but what he's most known for is for years he led our men's ministry known as FRAT, Men's FRAT. And Men's FRAT uh, was this weekly men's gathering that happened in, 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 a se in one season. In fact, FRAT was so big. It was running about 12 to 1400 men every week, which was arguably one of the largest men's ministry in the nation at the time. And Keith, I mean, he's just a stud. And he's one of the best teachers I've ever listened to. And I can still remember to this day messages that he's preached on this stage and conversations that we've had that, that have become foundational for me because they rocked me so much. And, but, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I can't fully introduce you to Keith until I introduce you to Lynn. This is Lynn. Lynn is Keith's uh, ride or die, his bride for 48 years, his partner in crime. And when I sat in their living room just a few weeks ago, getting to know their story, uh, even at a deeper level, I saw Keith and I saw that Keith, he's now over 70. And Keith, I know you're watching, you look it, uh, but Lynn, <laughs> but Lynn, you still look just as radiant and strong as I have ever seen you. And Lynn, she's just got this incredible story that she gave me permission to share. See, Lynn, she grew up near Philly and her dad wasn't always the greatest and home wasn't always amazing. And so this one night as a kid, it had hit the fan and, and it was so bad. She runs out into the street and she shouts up into the sky. She says, God, if you're real, do something. Well, well, about two weeks later, she said that Billy Graham's brother-in-law was coming through on a crusade and she didn't have anything better to do. So her and some friends went to cause some trouble and, and they actually did a really good job because they actually got escorted out by the police. And so the, as the police are escorting her out of this arena, the pastor from stage shouts, there is a father that loves you. And for Lynn, that was like a hook to a fish. It just grabbed her head and turned her around. And she actually paused the officer and she said, can, can, can I listen to this? And the officer paused 
And they actually sat in the aisle together and she was spellbound and listening. And at the end, when it came time to trust Jesus, to accept Jesus, to to want to follow Jesus, sitting next to an officer, she did. Uh, Well, a few weeks later, she realized she wanted to give church a try. and, And so she finds this church hayride. Well, she goes out, she gets on the trailer for the hayride and one bump leads to another bump. And then the next thing you know, she literally falls into Keith's lap. And Keith, as she fell on him, he romantically fell hard for her. And as he's helping her up, I kid you not, Keith in his deep voice way goes, hi, my name is Keith and I love you. (laughs) Well, sure enough, They did eventually start dating and one thing led to another and a few years later, the wedding bells chimed and they started a life together. They said their I do's, they started uh, life, they started trying to figure out what it means to follow Jesus and uh, Lynn shared that she quickly realized Keith was dramatically different than any other man she had ever experienced in life. And, And over the years, he has proven time and time again to be her steady, trusting partner. Well, Keith, he becomes a pastor and she's right by his side and they're making it happen and and they move all over the place. They finally start a family and the family starts to grow. And as the family is growing, they move from one place to another. And and this is when things started to hit the fan. Things started to get a little bit crazy and and their experience uh, during this time, they, they experience a betrayal, a betrayal at work that left them churchless and jobless and communityless like deep hurt and it hitting the fan. And, and as Keith reflected on that season, he said that he never, really trust, he never really struggled to trust that God was good. He just really struggled to give him control because he thought surely God could use his help. Lynn, on the other hand, she said that, that although she, she knew that she could go to God, she was always skeptical. She was fundamentally struggling with this idea that God was actually a good father, that there was such a thing as a good father. Father. She kept get going to him, but she always would go to him with, with her doubts and with her questions and with her wrestling. And, and she discovered that within all of that, that God kept being safe, safe to ask anything to, to, to beat upon his chest, to question him and to cry with. And through all of this, they just keep day after day, listening and following, listening and following, slowly laying a brick by brick by brick over time. And Keith and Lynn, eventually, they and their two boys, they moved to Lancaster. And shortly after they moved here, again, it hit the fan for them and, and they started to suffer. Uh, they had a miscarriage at 28 weeks. And if you've walked through a, a miscarriage, you just know how much that breaks a parent's heart. Um, so they start healing from that. And eventually God gives them uh, two more boys and finally their family is full. It's them and their four boys and life was finally feeling right. The family was full, ministry was booming, and I can't say this too loud because Lynn will debate me and possibly arm wrestle me, which scares me, Um, but Keith was a stud, like a rock star during the season. I mean, he's speaking over 300 times a year, and in in all of that, they choose to become bivocational, and and they launch five farmer markets uh, just so they can feed their four growing boys because they were eating them out of house and home. But again, in the midst of really good moments, they had it hit the fan. And they had it hit the fan more times than, than I can count. I mean, they had money stolen. They had dreams fall apart. They had friends betray them. Things just hitting the fan left and right. Good moments followed by bad moments. But God, through it all, was there. And through it all, listening and following, listening and following, was slowly building a foundation for them. Uh, by 2009, by 2009, they had been on staff for years, and they were preparing to graduate their largest men's frat class ever. There was about 1,300 guys that they were looking to celebrate that year, and they were also excited to celebrate uh, that their third son was going to be turning 18 that year as well. Um, but something just didn't feel right. Uh, and they got a call.
why it took way longer than she knew it should. And, and she started to realize in her mama's heart and also with her EMT training that, that something just wasn't right. And on uh, April 1st of 2009, um, Caleb got a phone call uh, letting him know that in fact, he did have brain cancer. And this threw their family into a whirlwind. I mean, how do you respond to that hitting the fan? I mean, it's one thing to, to be ran out of a job or to be lied to or to be betrayed, to, uh, be betrayed or to have your business flop or your dreams crushed. I mean, that's like your fan. But how do you as a, fan, as a parent watch that hit your kid? I mean, how are they supposed to stand under that? And this led to surgery after surgery, but the first surgery was, was actually botched and the surgeon missed 40% of the tumor. And, and because he missed it, it left Caleb partially paralyzed on his left side, and, which this then led to more whirlwind doctor's visits, more it hitting the fan, more surgeries, more moments. And, and amazingly through all of this, God somehow or another used CHOP, Children's Hospital of Philly, uh, to show up in incredible ways. And, and they were actually able to remove the remaining 40% of that tumor and at the same time miraculously restore Caleb's left side. And Keith and Lynn, this whole time, as their world is hitting the fan, as the weight of all of this is hitting them, I mean, they're still trying to lift one brick at a time to listen and follow, to listen and follow. And some days it seemed just too much to bear. And what they discovered was it, was, it wasn't them lifting and following, but it was actually their small group, their tribe coming alongside of them and, and lifting and carrying and moving one day at a time. A hope, a hope would start to bud. And then it just would seem like another fan would fall on it and destroy it. And this was their life. This was their life for five and a half years. And after five and a half years of exhausting battle, Caleb battled to the end. And on December the 3rd of 2014, he stepped from his mom's loving arms to his heavenly father's loving arms. And on what should have been his 24th birthday celebration, we gathered here in this very room at Mannheim to celebrate his life and his legacy. We, we gathered here to remember Caleb and, and his incredible legacy, but also his incredible heart that led him to start a foundation called A Week Away, which brings hope and rest to families battling life-threatening illnesses. It's, it's amazing to think that this March, A Week Away, uh, will celebrate 10 years and also 250 families being served and cared for. But as much as Keith and Lynn wanted that moment almost 10 years ago to be the end of their it hitting the fan, it was actually um, only after Caleb's passing that Keith started to realize and he had time and the opportunity to finally admit that, that his legs, um, his legs were shaking from more than just grief. And as much as he didn't want to admit it, he did know it and he didn't want to voice it, but when but when that shaking caused him to slip and fall one day in front of Lynn, he, he finally had to own it. And, and that confession led to another round of appointments. But this time it wasn't their, for their son. It was for Keith. And the rock solid man that Lynn had held onto for decades was now starting to shake and to hold on to her. And it was discovered that he had Parkinson's and it would slowly be taken over his body. And today, almost 10 years later, um, due to the Parkinson's, Keith is physically a fraction of the man that so many of us once knew and loved. He, he, and he admits that his body has betrayed him, um, but his mind, his heart, his soul are as strong as ever. And I can testify that they are. I don't know many couples I don't know many couples who have faced as much it as Keith and Lynn. And I don't, and I didn't even begin to start to share some of the stuff that Lynn has personally faced, what some of their boys have faced. I mean, what most couples, if they faced what they had faced, they would be simply crushed, bitter, rotten with anger and resentment. But because Keith and Lynn had laid a foundation of bedrock, they can still say to this day, 
They can still say, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. They still, after all they have faced, still say they trust in the Lord and that he is good. And this is what blew me away as we sat in their living room underneath photographs of better days, easier days, days with more family members around the table, they with conviction looked at me and said, we are so blessed. Who says that? We are so blessed. We wouldn't wish this on anyone, but we also wouldn't change it. So I gotta ask you, what are you building your life on? Are you building on bedrock? Is your foundation ready for what life might bring? Because the truth is, the better the foundation we have, the better we can handle it. The better the foundation we have, the better we can handle it. And the way we build a foundation that stands through all the storms that life might throw at us is by doing exactly what Keith and Lynn have done for 48 years. They listened and they followed. They listened and they followed brick by brick, day by day. Guys, getting to sit with them a couple of weeks ago was truly a sacred moment in my life. But the moment that moved me beyond words, that made me have like an ugly cry was when they started um, praying for you. And I was so thankful that they were willing to pray for us, for us as a church, to have a relationship with Jesus in such a way that we too can have the resilience to face whatever life hits the fan. And, and I was also so thankful that, that I had my phone out and I had it recording because I just wanted to remember the details of their story, but I was so thankful we captured that moment and I'm so thankful that they gave us permission to share that prayer, their prayer for you, for us to have resilience, to be able to share that as a church. So let's join Keith and Lynn in prayer. Father, how we love you. You are so many things that we can't even describe in our lives. Um, but what you are is personally involved with us, searching for us, longing for us, loving us, caring for us. Thank you so much for what Jesus said to Thomas when he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Um, it just gave us something to hang our hats on, Lord. Say, okay, I need to find the way, I will follow Jesus. Be dependent upon him, I need to find truth, I will follow Jesus and be trusting that he has truth for me. And I will follow Jesus. And he will say, I'll give, me, he'll give you the life. And that life is found in the moment that not yesterday or tomorrow, but just now in the moment where Jesus shows up at your doorstep, knocking at the door saying, I'm here, let's spend this time together. I thank you that we get to do life with Jesus. We get to do life with you, our Father, and the Spirit. We just thank you for what binds us together. Uh, it's not a church or a place, it's a being, a person, the God of the universe. We love you and thanks for your presence and your care, being with us throughout the entire journey. In Christ's name, amen. And Lord, I'm so reminded of our time here today that you are faithful to walk alongside of us on our journey. Mm. You never leave us, you never have left us, and you never will. What a promise. Father God, you, you are faithful beyond our ability to comprehend. 
just the endless love that you have showered on us as we have walked together. Lord, it, it certainly is not always comfortable, is it? And how grateful I am that you sent your son to walk this earth and experience absolutely everything that we have gone through. Mm. You know our pain, you know our questions, and you know the outcomes. Mm. Lord, I know I'm one to ask a lot of those questions. I know I'm one to run the other way often. And I thank you so much that you are the hound of heaven. You chase us down and then you lift us up and you carry us. Mm. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your truth. May we live in that, walk in that, and encourage one another in that. Thank you, God. Your name. Amen.